welcome. I'm Lillian Chin, Director of Client Partnerships. In this month's update, we look at the residential property markets and the key factors driving its performance. Let's get started. Towards the end of a remarkable 2021 calendar year, property prices were beginning to moderate, particularly across Sydney and Melbourne. The smaller capitals peaked later, some well into Q1 of calendar year 2022, with all markets now retracing from peak. Are the property price depreciations representative of a crash or a correction and what will the lasting impacts be? Let's begin with a simple review of the fundamentals of economics, supply and demand. Starting with supply, and we see that new listings are low and tracking lower, ignoring the usual spike in listings we traditionally see in early mid spring. In short, supply is soft with total listings heading toward a near five-year low for this time of the year. Turning to demand, measured by the volume of dwelling sales by number, not by dollar, and while below the 2021 peak, the number of transactions remain above the previous five-year average. This remained the case as recently as September 2022 suggesting that prospective buyers are continuing to acquire properties in large numbers, albeit at lower dollar values than they would have needed to during the dizzying heights of the property market in late 2021. To summarize, we are seeing demand persisting, particularly relative to supply retracing, with no evidence of panicked selling or material upticks in distress listings. And even if we did, the demand is there to mop it up. Turning now to the direction of property market generally and to contextualize where the market is trending towards, it is worth noting that Australia's national growth in property prices during the COVID-19 pandemic period trough to peak was 28.6%. This was the average across all markets, with capital cities growing 25.5%, while regional areas growing a whopping 41.6%, driven by tree changes and sea changes, looking for lifestyle over lockdown. Looking far and wide, and the consensus continues to sit at a 15% fall nationally, plus or minus. Naturally, this will vary based on location and with capital cities down 4.3% and regionals down 3.6% in the three months to the end of September, the momentum is clearly set as we trend towards the peak to trough correction of circa 15%. So what does all of this mean? Investing in property, be it to live in or as an investment, in its own right, is a longer-term proposition. Outside of a smaller cohort of flippers, property investing is a buy-and-hold proposition. Consider over 20 years what an appropriate return on your capital would be. The national average growth in real property dwellings has been a very conservative 3.2% per annum since March 2000 or 1.9% per annum since March 2005. Now, when you distill all of the noise about the property market and its current softening, and adopting the consensus 15% national fall for simplicity, a residential property owner will have experienced a 13.6% increase in their property's value from the pandemic trough. That remains well in excess of the national average price growth since March 2000. It is an interesting time for the market, noting that with full employment, buyers remain active. A key driver will be access to credit to achieve purchases, with modeling showing a 24% decrease 
in total borrowing power based on the impact on new borrower serviceability models. We always caution against this being considered a perfect correlation. Banks haven't simply been lending to each borrower's fullest extent. This is evidence across a range of data. However, it clearly set the direction of the market into the medium term and aligns with our thinking around a circa 15% fall nationwide. Projecting the behavior of the property market into the medium term becomes ever challenging given the many macro issues at play, including domestic and international supply chain inflation impacting new property developments and net migration. It seems only a few short months ago that the issue du jour was the construction industry and the post-lockdown sugar hit, which saw a flood of new building approvals being issued. However, on the back of building material and labor cost inflation rising at its fastest pace in nearly 50 years on the back of supply constraints, new building approvals have softened quite materially. This will only contribute to any undersupply of property on the market, driven by the current macroeconomic and rising interest rate environment. Likewise, residential property as an investment proposition remains attractive, while we remain in an environment with low vacancies and rising rents. Softening property prices but higher rents may increase the attractiveness of residential property as an income investment strategy. And this will only be fueled once we see the full return of immigration to Australia, which will only serve to accelerate the demand for property to buy and rent, which will assist in placing an effective floor under the market. In summary, property prices are falling as the post-COVID fervor and excesses are being wound back. This is a good thing. Importantly, however, the longer-term fundamentals do point towards resilience and an orderly correction to the property market. Let's now turn to an overview of the property credit sector here in Australia. Trending alongside property with a short lag, the volume of credit being written in the market is falling from peak in both owner-occupied and investment loans. Australians have utilized the low rate environment to put themselves in really strong overall positions in their home loans, with significant numbers well in advance on their repayments. Over 70% are at least one to three months ahead, with nearly 40% over two years ahead. Of course, at the individual level, increased rates will impact some more than others, and we are acutely aware that we are talking about people's lives and livelihoods. Addressing the macro picture, we see an extremely robust sector, ready to meet the challenges of an increasing rate environment. As I mentioned a moment ago, on aggregate, banks have not simply lent individuals to their fullest extent possible. Consider arrears. Immediately post-GFC, arrears across banks rose to over 2% of assets. They barely rose at all throughout the pandemic and have retraced since from that momentary increase. Certainly at Little Financial, our arrears also sit at or near the lowest level as we've mentioned. This is counterintuitive, but it's against a backdrop of multi-decades of tightening around lending. Our regulators know that bad loans are written in good times and have introduced and enhanced a range of legislations and policies to remove risk from the system. Volumes will continue to normalize and arrears will increase from the current lows. These will always lack the increase in interest rates with the CBA's head of Australian economics, Gareth Aid, having recently flagged that it takes circa three months for their customers to feel the impact of an increase in borrow rates. What is important is that the foundation is the strongest possible to begin 
this part of the cycle with wages growth, full employment, household savings, and large portions of the population well ahead in their mortgage repayments. We look forward to keeping you posted on these important measures at our next update. That concludes our investor update for October 2022. Thank you for joining us.